Welcome to the Transform Your Wealth and Health podcast, where experts in wealth, health, and fitness help transform your life. Here's your host, Andy Arder. Today's guest is technology coach, facilitator, and podcaster Shabir Nakvi, who's helped lead e-commerce and anti-spam technology solutions, and he's going to tell us all about it today. How are we doing, Shabir? Hi, Andy. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Enjoying the weather. What about yourself? Yeah, well, uh, enjoying is uh, quite a positive word. I'm probably melting in it right now. It's pretty hot here in London, um, and my flat gets pretty warm as well, so melting in the weather is probably an accurate description for me. Yeah, well, I was talking to a guy who was in Glasgow the other day, and we were talking at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he was saying, yeah, it's lovely and warm here, 22 degrees, and I had to tell him, I had to break the news to him, it was 31 in London, so... uh, yeah. yeah, crazy, <laughs> crazy. About time we had some decent weather though, mind you. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, great, great time to get outside and enjoy the weather. But likewise, it is hot. So anyone going outside, definitely be careful about the weather and take care of yourself. Yeah, that's it. And, and your animals too, because I've been walking the dog and he's been sort of running out of puff as we're going around. And, you know, you've got to look after the animals as well as the human. Oh gosh, I can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. So you've been doing lots of things in e-commerce and technology that have been leading and paving the way. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into it in the first place. Yeah, sure. I'd I'd probably say I went through the traditional means of uh, education. So I actually studied computer science at university. I did my master's in computer science as well and then went into a software development job. And my first role was at Rightmove, um, Mm -hmm. the online property portal. Yeah. And I worked at Rightmove Overseas, um, specifically looking at the overseas part of the website. And when I started, it was literally just myself and another developer. And we developed absolutely everything on the overseas site. Uh, a lot of it is actually still there today. So if you do go there, there's a good chance that I probably touched on some bits and bobs uh, that you probably see on the website and probably wow. some of the systems as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, we, it was a great learning experience. We, we pretty much touched everything. Uh, and as a first job coming out of university, it's probably one of those dream jobs in a way that gives yeah. you so much insight into you know, how things work in the real world and just gives you a good opportunity to learn all sorts of stuff. One of the things I really enjoyed working on over there was actually a custom anti-spam solution. Yeah. So, yeah, about... I think it's probably about two years into myself working at Rightmove. Um, it was clear that we needed some sort of solution to deal with spam. So what we saw was that a lot of bots and those types of things were coming onto the website and sending just gibberish and spam. And our customers as Rightmove are estate agents and the property developers. So yeah. they were just getting a little bit annoyed and frustrated that, you know, you're sending us all these so-called leads, um, you know, maybe we're getting, you know, a hundred in a month, but 50 of them are spam. Um, and we really needed to figure out a good way of dealing with that. So we did a bit of research. Um, I remember I was looking into some third party solutions, what's out there on the market. Um, Mm -hmm. we didn't really like anything out there. So we actually decided, well, let's actually try build something ourselves. Um, this is probably back in, I want to say something like 2012, maybe 2011, 2012 now. Yeah. Um, we decided, okay, let's try to build something ourselves. Um, and it was in, done in two stages, essentially. So I first built something where we were monitoring the user behavior on the site. So it was essentially trying to see how long do people actually take to fill out the form? Um, you know, what is the typical behavior of the user? Do they use a lot of you know, things like autofill. So if they're using autofill, then obviously it probably takes them very little time to fill out a form. We're also Mm. looking at stuff like, do people send a lot of emails in a short space of time? So maybe they look at 10 properties and they're wanting to send all of their emails all in in one go after they've viewed 10 properties, or do they want to space them out? So they'll look at one property, they'll have a good review of that property, and then they'll send uh, an email about that property, and then they'll go into the next one and follow that again. Yeah. So what we did was essentially, we built up a database of all of this data. And if I remember right, I think I analyzed something like 10,000 emails to try and figure out some common user behavior or what looked like to be spam. And without going into too much detail, we essentially identified um, a few key 
behaviors that were clearly bots or they were clearly just spam behavior. So we set up a few parameters to basically say, okay, if, if a user or a, what we thought was a user were doing these sorts of things while mm -hmm. filling out the form and how mm -hmm. frequently they were sending it and what was the gap in between each email send and all of that sort of stuff based on that, yeah. we would first flag it as a potential spam thing. And then if it was a kind of a repeat offender, we would then completely block them. Um, so that was the approach that we took and we completely built that ourselves. In fact, I, I was the only developer building that. Wow. And I can't remember how long it took, but it was probably a good couple of months. And I remember it was kind of during the summer because I would have dreams about it. <laughs> um, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's literally one of those things. So if you, and I'm sure you must have experienced this as well. Like if you obsess on something and you're really yeah. trying to figure out how to get something working, it's literally in your mind all the time. And that's yeah. what this was to me because one, this hadn't been done before at that time. So it was something new and no one had, no one knew how to do it. And two, you were like a human it, bot, wasn't you really? You were actually, you're the guy that you sometimes wonder, you know, when people talk about the algorithms and things like that, um, at these huge companies of which obviously right move is, and you helped to develop it but you're the guy that's actually behind it all, the one that we never ever get to talk to. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I suppose you could see it that way, yeah. yeah. Which um, was cutting edge technology back in 2012, I take it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there were, they were like I said, third party solutions out there, but they didn't mm. do what we wanted it to do. And I think one of the key things, if, you're, if you've ever worked at a large company, I'm sure you'll know this as well, that they want to keep all of their data as much as possible in house. So they don't want some of their crucial data going off to a third party, especially if you're working with kind of system critical type of things. So, you know, for us, the system critical bit was sending an email to our estate agents who are our customers. Mm. So if we're adding a third party system into that part of our system, then that just you know invites potential risk if anything goes wrong with a third party if they've got a data breach if they've got a security issue then our whole system has a security issue or our whole system has a data breach so yeah. that that's the typical approach that any big enterprise company will take uh, is to try and develop some of those things in-house or even if they're using a third party product they will bring that product in-house so they'll purchase the product purchase the license fully customize it in-house and have it running on premises or in the cloud for their own thing. So that's a, the typical way of doing it. So we had the same thinking as well back then um, and we wanted to develop something ourselves. So that, that's what we did. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, back in them days, I mean, how, what was your thinking? I, I mean, behind the whole project, because here you are trying to develop stuff to protect um, the end user and also your own company, Rightmove. But how did you go about the whole project? I mean, sitting down trying to create something completely that doesn't exist on um, yeah. technology <laughs> is something that would blow my mind, I believe. You know, how do you sit around in a small team of people and say, right, we're going to develop this completely from scratch? I think it's um, the same type of approach that you take with any task that you don't initially know how to do, and that's mm -hmm. trying to break it down step by step. So like I mentioned, the first thing we actually needed to do was try to identify what do we actually even classify as spam. So we built yeah. some very basic metrics to at least start monitoring what's actually happening on the site. So we built a few things which will see how are people filling out the email uh, form uh, when they're sending leads um, and those types of things. And then we literally just took it step by step. Um, like I said, this was done over a couple of months. It wasn't done in like just a week or anything like that. Um, we probably monitored stuff for a full month or something along those lines. I think I then spent a good week only doing analysis on what on the data that we've got back and then we started identifying what is the actual thing that we can build so i think it's just the same approach that you would almost take with any task that you're not quite sure how to do but you kind of know what your ultimate end goal is and that is just break it down step by step i think if you always jump into something and try to automatically go to the end goal you probably find yourself just really confused and not sure where to start, where to look. So I think that it was the same approach we took with anything else, which is, yeah, just break it down step by step. Mm -hmm. so, so did you at the time go around doing other work such as talking at conferences or anything like that? Not at that stage. At that stage, I was, the only talks I actually did were internal. So I did do a few talks internally. I did some uh, technical talks. I remember I actually spoke about 
the anti-spam solution internally, sharing it with the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually also, I just remembered actually, I was also involved with uh, doing the first uh, international version of the website as well. We launched a version in Sweden. Right. Um, and I was heavily involved in that as well. So we had rightmoveoverseas.se, if I remember right. Mm. Um, and that might actually still be there with some Swedish translations. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was actually a really interesting project as well. And again, I did an internal talk for that. But I think it was near the end of my time at Rightmove or just after when I actually started um, going to a lot more meetups. Um, and then I was just interested in what we call agile software development. So... Mm -hmm. The old way of developing software was known as waterfall and it's, it is as it sounds where you do one stage of like designing your solution and then you go on to implementing it, then you go on to testing it and you have these big bulky stages and you just do one thing at a time. Right. Whereas with Agile, you essentially try to do a small iteration of something and try to get something out to the market as quickly as possible and then you look at the feedback and then you try to improve on it. So and, I understand that Apple are doing a little bit more of this nowadays. Rather than getting everything perfect, they put it out there, test it, and then sort of adapt it, whereas other companies have been doing this in the past. But uh, Apple are getting more into it, I understand. Where. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, all technology companies are wanting to do this because they can see the value in trying to deliver something to your customer and then listening to what the customer says in order to improve your product and yeah. truly deliver something that your customer wants. I mean, if you look at even, you know, the way Microsoft now are using Windows 10, I mean, before the way they push out Windows is that you'll just get, you know, Windows 7 back in the day. And then once they're happy with that and they, they just build a, a huge new update and then that will go on to Windows 8 and so yeah. on. With Windows 10, what they're doing now is they're just constantly putting out updates. Um, they're just constantly just doing, using it almost like a software as a service type of model where they're just con continuously pushing out updates and that's the same that people are trying to do with products as well they just want to continuously push things out update things you know with with apple for example it, you know they're not doing the massively new groundbreaking innovative machines now they're just mm. taking their macbook pro and they just slapped a new processor in there did a few other tweaks and and whatnot and pushed it out to the market mm. and i'm sure it will sell a few million units again <laughs> as well <laughs> people love their stuff don't they <laughs> exactly yes. yeah so you've been doing some other problem solving as well and also some platform migrations yeah absolutely and this is um yeah sure so this has probably been the bulk of my time over the last couple of years now mm -hmm. um so i work at a company right now called uxnet supporter group and we've been involved in a large migration program or, or actually rather multiple migration programs within the so company. what is that for the layman yeah like, like sure me. so <laughs> imagine um as a company we have many websites many e-commerce websites mm -hmm. uh, for each different designer brand um so if, if you don't know what the company does they're essentially an online luxury fashion company oh, right. so you'll go on one of their websites you can buy all sorts of different clothing people would have heard of the websites maybe like netta porte mr porter yeah. um mm -hmm. they also power about over I think 45 different online brands as well so websites like Armani's clothing website Chloe Moncler Valentino Ferrari all of their clothing parts of their websites as mm. in the actual e-commerce website is powered by our systems all right okay That's now great. yeah so what we've actually had to do is we we had um, what we consider to be a legacy platform so we've been using some e-commerce stuff that we built ourselves um, for many years now um, and obviously it's kind of about time that we were due an upgrade so to speak um, and we decided to use IBM's solution so they've got an, uh, a product called Watson Commerce yes and that's an e-commerce platform for large enterprises and obviously as a company like ourselves we, we are a large enterprise um, and we can benefit from a lot of the, the features that IBM Watson Commerce gives so We've essentially been migrating brand by brand onto this new platform. And that is a massive task to do, as I'm sure if, if anyone's been involved in any sort of migration project or program, it's not easy at all. There's so many different parts to it. Um, it might sound simple. It might sound like you're just moving a website. To another. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wish it were as simple as that. It would make my job so much easier. But yeah, exactly. Press a few buttons. You've got a new website. Off you go. 
Um, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. I mean, you're, you're literally talking about systems that go all the way down to the warehouse. Um, so we, we literally have uh, automated machines in our warehouses. So mm -hmm. it, it does all of that automatic packing type of stuff. So it selects your products and you literally have machines going to different shelves in our warehouse, picking out the right products, putting it on a kind of assembly line sort of thing. And then at the end, um, we have people doing the hand packing of those products for delivery. So when we're doing a migration, you have to actually think about not just the website on what the customer sees on the front end, but how it then integrates with all of those different backend systems down to the warehouse. And yeah. if you're moving platform, then yeah, you have to you have to change everything. It's not just the website; it's everything going down the stack. So it's you know the intermediary commerce platform. It's any you know payment systems. It's any delivery systems. Uh, anything that you integrate with maybe a third party for some of those things. It's anything that you might be doing your reporting off, your finance uh, related stuff off, producing invoices, and then finally integrating with the warehouse system to actually manage that end delivery to your customer. So yeah. as soon as we start talking about one migration, you realize, oh gosh, there's you know a billion different things to that one migration. And mm -hmm. like I mentioned, we have 45 different brands that we manage along with our own four websites, uh, which are Netaporte, Mr. Porter, The Outnet, and Ukes. So we've got a lot of migrations that we're trying to do at the moment. <laughs> sounds like um, a ton of work. Absolutely, yeah. Each one is really challenging, um, but we're, we're getting better with each migration. So we've done four migrations so far, uh, and we've got a whole bunch planned out over the next you know, few years um, that we're going to try and crack through. But each one is really, really challenging, and it's been quite innovative as well. We've put IBM Watson Commerce in the cloud. That's never actually been done before, so we're using AWS for that. So that's very innovative, um, wow. and that's a world first as well. And yeah, we, we've got a lot of people obviously working on this. I think for one of the, the main migration I was involved with was uh, for the Outnet. So that's one of our own websites that we have. Um, we probably had over 20 or 25 development teams working on it um, over the course of you know a good year, year and a half. That's or so. a big project. Uh, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah, complex stuff, um, but very exciting, very interesting as well. So that's that's what I've been doing over the last couple of years. That's my that's been my main focus. So we, so we now know you're the clever guy. That when we walk in to see all this technology happening in front of us, you're the guy that's actually behind it, making it happen. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. I think the clever guys are the guys in the development teams. They're the ones who are now solving those really tricky problems. I'm now more of the guy who's just trying to pull it and glue it all together. Okay. Um, that's that's kind of more of my role. So like you mentioned right at the beginning, I do a lot more facilitation. I'm mm -hmm. coaching now. So uh, yeah. my, my whole role is all about trying to bring together all of these different teams so that we can work together and we can deliver these large, complex programs that we do. Um, so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is okay. really facilitating the conversations between the development teams, trying to bring together their output so we can actually deliver this migration. You work like the glue, so to speak, making sure everything's pulled together. Exactly. Yeah, work. exactly. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, uh, I've done a little bit of um, work on some of those systems in the past on the, on the mechanical side of it rather than the, the technical side of it, like yourself, with some early works that um, Sainsbury's was doing with some German kit that they had over that was helping them move their products around. So, uh, yeah, oh, I've nice. seen in action. I mean, this was probably not the kind of stuff that Amazon are using now and high tech. This was probably 10, 12 years ago, so it was on the early days of it all, but even so impressive back in them days, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely, and it's it's crazy how quickly technology evolves. Like, there's literally new things going on every month, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So we've heard about your development work. Tell us a little bit about your family life and and what you do at home. And I understand you keep fit also. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm very family oriented. Um, I actually have a daughter who's now six months old. Um, so that's been keeping me pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, family's a, a big part of uh, my life I, I try to spend as much time as I can with my family and then yeah you rightly mentioned I'm, I'm always keen on trying to stay fit so um, I think before I had my daughter I was probably uh, a lot more fitter than I am now I think most of that is probably down to poor um, food choices I think um, sometimes when you're in a bit of a hurry you 
typically you go for the easier option, which is quite often fast food, uh, which mm -hmm. is always not good for you. But yeah, um, I think even now I try to keep myself fit. Um, I go to the gym three times a week. I actually do a bit of cycling every morning. Um, I've got a cycling machine at home, so I'll do either 20 or 30 minutes of cycling first thing in the morning. And I just find that it's a it's a really good way for me to start my day it wakes me up it puts me in a positive mind frame it just gets me ready for the day um yeah. I, I typically do not check work emails or anything like that first thing in the morning a lot the of main people do that. that i know i know and i've personally found that if i start doing that it puts me down the wrong path for the day um i instantly start feeling overburdened um I, I wouldn't say stressed but it just puts my mind into a more of a tactical mindset where i'm constant I'm, I'm immediately trying to respond to the smaller tasks at hand yeah. which are typically in emails and i That's like it. to think at things more of that macro level at a strategic level yeah. um and i feel that if you jump into your email straight away in the morning it gets you thinking more about the micro and the smaller details whereas mm -hmm. if you step away from that and do a few other tasks in the morning so for me that's cycling i read a bit about technology news and general news as well while i'm doing that that puts me in a, in a much more positive mindset i can look at the bigger picture i can look at things more strategically and then at a later point in the morning will i go and actually check my emails and usually it's probably well after i've had breakfast that i will start going into emails mm -hmm. and really digging through the details do you find that you've missed anything and you, you think, damn, I should have been on that quicker? Or, or is it just generally day-to-day -day stuff that you've... No, it's, it's generally day-to-day -day, um, because I usually check emails um, in the evening as well. So if there's anything that's come through late in the evening, then usually I would have picked it up by 10, 30, 11 p.m. anyway. Um, and then anything in the morning that's come through first thing, usually it's fine for it to be responded to after you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning or something yeah. like that. I mean, when I say later in the morning, I actually wake up usually at about six o'clock in the morning. So even after I've done all of my morning stuff, um, I'm usually onto emails, usually by nine o'clock. So too that's bad, actually still pretty early anyway. Mm. So you're also a podcaster. Tell us all about your podcast. Yeah, sure. So the podcast is a completely um, passion project, pet project of mine. It's called The Graph The Show. It's all about speaking to people who are trying to achieve some sort of goal in their lives. Quite often that ends up being people who are trying to start their own businesses or people who are trying to achieve uh, some sort of fitness goal, for example. So I end up speaking to a lot of people in those spaces, but it's all about just trying to share what they're doing along their journey at the moment. So I've even spoken to people who are into technology companies. I've spoken to a couple of people who are, who are startups. I've spoken to people who, uh, one guy, for example, who's actually uses photography as a bit of a side um, side job of his. So he's got his day job working um, uh, as a developer, actually, and he does a bit of photography on the side. So it's all about how did he go about getting to that point where he can do a bit of photography and how does he want to continue that going forwards as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's all about just trying to share people's journeys uh, to whatever they're trying to do. And hopefully that will be useful to other people. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the premise. That's, that's what, the, I, that's what it's about. That's the grafter show. So how often do you put your podcasts out? So originally I started putting them out every two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I've now got to a point where I've got a little bit of a backlog of recordings. So oh, right. I'm trying to up that up to every week now. Um, so hopefully I'll have an, the next episode out this weekend. Uh, my previous one was out last weekend, so I'm, I'm working on the next one, but at the very least it'll be every fortnight. Um, if possible, I will try to get one out every weekend. Okay, so so what's important to you nowadays? What are, what are you really aspirational about and what's going to make you move on in life? I think having a daughter really changes your perspective in life. I think that having any sort of child, um, when, when you go through that experience and you'll see them grow up, I think it changes your priorities in life and rightly so. So I think my priority in life is ultimately trying to get freedom for myself so I can give more to my daughter. Um, mm -hmm. So however that is, um, and that, right now I, I see the, the podcast as being quite a nice um, way of building up content that maybe my daughter can listen to one day in the future and actually yeah. really be inspired by some episodes there. So not only is it for myself and people listening now, but I see that as a piece of content that can be consumed in the future as well. Uh, even with my day job, everything that I try to do over there, I try to do it in such a way where I've got a little bit of flexibility. I can try and spend a bit of time with my family um, and have and work around that. 
And I ultimately, I just want to get to a point uh, in life where I can have more freedom with my time. I can give more mm. time to my family, uh, and yeah. especially my daughter. That's kind of my ultimate goal at the moment. I get you. It's the sort of thing that you can do from home, your kind of job sometimes, I would imagine. Yeah, I, and you know, my company is great in that regard where I do have a bit of flexibility. And obviously, it's, I think it's probably the same at most companies where absolutely there are going to be those days where you need to be in the office you might need to be there early you might need to be there a bit late you've got meetings i travel a little bit as well we have another office in italy so i actually mm-hmm. just flew back from italy yesterday afternoon what's your um, italian like uh non-existent i'd say <laughs> <laughs> um i i've literally um not learned much and that's that's really poor of me i i just know how to say good morning thank you and you're welcome and uh, i think it <laughs> probably good enough to get you by isn't it yeah, yeah i think so yeah i might have to quickly um with that google translate on my phone if i need anything more than that <laughs> yeah i think so yeah <laughs> um but yeah I, I think that's that's life with any job um where you're absolutely going to have those types of days where you need to be in the office you might need to travel around a bit but then fortunately i do have a bit of flexibility where i can work from home now and then as well so that's a great opportunity just for me to have a bit of a better work-life balance okay well we're getting towards the end of the show now Shabir so a couple of little things I was going to try and ask you is relating to entrepreneurial books do you read much or are you an audible guy or what, what do you do in the way of books I actually read a lot of articles um, so I, I use uh, something called Feedly uh, which is essentially like an RSS feed collator so you can mm. just put in whatever websites and stuff that you want to follow um, and I pretty much read a whole bunch of stuff from entrepreneur.com, from fastcompany.com, uh, and a few other websites. Right now, I'm actually reading uh, Gary Vee's Crushing It. Um, yeah. I haven't actually got around to fully finishing that off. I'm about, I think, 50% of the way through that at the moment. So I'm reading that. Um, I've read The Lean Startup before as well, and a lot of those values obviously resonate with me, having worked with Agile um, as a software delivery practice. It's essentially mm. what we do is trying to deliver minimal viable products all the time and iterate on them. So that works quite a lot with me. I probably have a little bit of a backlog of bo- books as well. So yeah, me too. I'm trying to remember, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I, wa- I wanna read a few around, um, kind of more around people and culture, because mm. I'm always fascinated by that topic. So there's a, there's a quite a popular book or called the seven habits of highly effective people. I think it was yeah. a, a management Stephen book. Covey, is it? I believe. Yeah, that's the one. So yeah. I want to get around to reading that. I think I've uh, read a bit of it before, but I didn't get around to finishing it. Mm-hmm. So that's something I want to read. Um, I read drive, which is a great book uh, by Dan Pink. Um, so if you, ha- if you really want to understand what does, what do people get motivated by? That's a great book to read. And it gives some, yeah, it gives some fascinating insights into into people and what you what you might think is their true motivation probably isn't. Um, so it's a really interesting book to read. And then uh, I want to get back and reread uh, "Start with Why" by Simon Sinek. Um, I think I read yeah. that quite a while back, but I, I just remember it being such a great read. I've probably forgotten a whole bunch of it. That I want to go back and reread that. I nearly got that one on Audible this month, but uh, I went for some others. And, uh, you know, when you get them on Audible, sometimes you think, damn, what did I get this one for? It's absolutely rubbish. But, <laughs> you know, you got next month. So I, I, that's the way I do it anyway. I, don't, I buy them on a monthly basis to so set myself a budget and then and then that's it. I don't overstep. That's a good way of doing it, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good way of doing it. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, a backlog of 20 books. You're never likely to read them. When you do, you're rushing through them and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I just give myself a month for, you know, this this time, I think it was a, a free for two offer that they had on. So um, I've actually got free books. So I'm, even I'm on a slight backlog at least. So <laughs> it's the physical books that worry me, Shabir. I've actually got about a dozen that I've, I've read eight, 10 pages of. I'm notorious. You know, I just read a few pages and then ditch them normally and move on to the next one and, few pages of those but i suppose that's my mind where i'm all over the place with various projects uh, and- i can completely relate i've got a couple of books sitting on my shelf right now that i, I really want to get through as well so i've got the google book how google works mm-hmm. um, that i really want to get through and then i've got more of a, a, a kind of techie book which is um introduction to discipline agile delivery which i actually picked up at a conference i think they were just handing it out mm-hmm. but it's um it's a bit more of an insight into enterprise agile delivery for software companies so i want to see if i want to get 
if I can get around to reading that as well. So is, I've got a is, couple of books as well. <laughs> <laughs> is it one for the um, the technology anoraks? Because I, I don't think I'm going to rush out and get that one myself. But um, you know, <laughs> possibly. I think, um, yeah, that that is probably more for people who are working at large enterprise companies. Yeah. Uh, but still want to deliver things a bit more fluidly and are trying to build a way of working or a model of working to deliver things quicker. I think that's probably, if you're, if you're looking to do that, you're trying to solve that problem in your company, yeah. then that's probably a, a good book to just pick up and read. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other books around that as well, like Enterprise Agile and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, that you can probably search for and, and read as well. Okay, well, it's been great to have you on the show. Thanks for giving us an insight into your background and these projects that you've been doing, which have been leading the way in the past. If you've got any future projects, please contact us. We'll have you back on the show absolutely at a drop of a hat, no problem. But how can people get hold of you if they want to talk to you or even get involved with the Grafter Show? Sure, well, firstly, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Um, in order to get in touch with me, I've got the normal social media sorts of channels. So... The Grafter Show uh, has an Instagram account, has a Twitter account, um, and you can also email info at thegraftershow.com. I've got a personal Twitter account, which I use quite often as well, which is Shabir Nakvi 14 So you can message me on any of those, um, and I'm more than likely to get back in touch with you. Brilliant. Thanks for being on the show, Shabir. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode, and until next time, start transforming your wealth and health now.